Hi, I am Leandro Facchinetti, and this is version control with Git. Meet Alice. Alice is vegan, but for her, salad isn't an option. She likes muffins and cookies and cake, that sort of thing. And she is writing her own cookbook because she spends a lot of time in the kitchen and her friends do as well. So they are all collaborating on this project. Initially, everything was simple. Each recipe was a plain text file in the file system, and that was it. But then Alice wanted to track different versions of the same recipe as she was working on the recipe. So maybe a version in which cookies had more sugar or less cocoa, that sort of thing. And it was hard for her to tell what was the difference between two files and who collaborated what and for what reason. Things got even worse when those files became email attachments and long threads of emails back and forth. So Alice thought, well, maybe Git is a good fit. If you have a project that is similarly based on plain text files, it may be a good fit for you as well. Those files may be just pros or recipes, or maybe source code for software. As long as it's plain text, Git can tell the difference between different versions and can help Alice along the way and can help you as well. On the other hand, if your project is based on images and movies and sound, then Git may not be ideal because those files are opaque. Git cannot tell the difference between two versions of the same file. It can only store the whole file again and again, and you're left to your own devices to find the differences and who collaborated what, that sort of thing. Well, to get started with Git, all Alice had to do was to go to the Git website, download the tools, and how to do that depends on the platform, so I'm not going to go into the details here. But what's important is to install the command line interface as well as some graphical user interface. In some cases, the command line interface may be the only option because you are SSAging into another machine or you don't even have anything beyond terminal access. But for day-to-day -day work, it's ideal to use a GUI, especially the support for Git in your text editor or IDE. It's just a lot better for the workflow. Once Git is installed, to set it up, Alice had to create three different files. The first is the Git config, and the path may change depending on your operating system. But the purpose of the file is straightforward, to identify her with her name and email, and to select a text editor to open when Git needs Alice to write some message. For instance, when she needs to write a commit message. We'll see more about that later. The second file that Alice had to create was to instruct Git to ignore some files. And in this file, she lists paths that should be ignored by Git in every project she may work on her machine, because those are files generated by the operating system or her text editor, something specific about her setup. Next, she had to create a file with her public SSH key to identify her computer when she's connecting to remote computers, as we'll see later. To start working with Git, Alice created a repository. There are different ways to start a repository, and first we have to understand what the repository even is. So, Alice first organized her files. All the different versions of the same recipe went into one single file, like cookie.txt. Those files compose the working directory, and that's how Git calls the files you may already have on your file system. The repository contains a snapshot of the working directory, and will contain other snapshots over time. So to begin with, the repository contains a copy of all the files in the working directory. But maybe Alice creates another file, like pancake.txt. Then the repository will contain another snapshot of the whole working directory, including that new file. In some ways, the repository is like Time Machine in macOS. It offers deduplication of files, Internally, Git will be smart enough to not store the same files over and over, occupying a lot of disk. It also offers utilities for you to see the difference between files among different versions, and a way to navigate in history. These snapshots 
are called commits. Commits point to their parents, and that's because commits are immutable. Once they are created, they cannot be changed, which means that a parent cannot be modified to point to its children. But when creating a commit, we always know what the parents are, so the children point to the parents. The timeline here is going from past to future from the bottom up, but the commits are pointing down. And also commits are atomic, which means that you cannot ask Git to revert a single file to a previous version. You have to do that for the whole repository. So coming back to the time machine analogy, it's like you cannot recover a single file from a previous backup. You can only restore the whole disk as it was back then. Next, note that the concept that Git tracks is lines. So for example, if you want an empty directory to exist in the repository, you have to create a file. It may be empty because an empty file still contains an empty line and Git is going to track that. And the convention is to have this file named .kip or .gitkip. So now that we understand what a repository is, let's see how Alice can create one. Well, she runs this command or uses the graphical user interface. And what happens is that there is the working directory with all the recipes in files, but then there is also this directory called .git. This directory is going to contain the repository and it's like a database that Alice will not touch by hand. She will always use the command line interface or a GUI to change the contents of the database, but it's important to understand that it's there. Coming back to the time machine analogy, it's like the .git directory is that external disk in which the computer is backed up. Now, the analogy here isn't perfect because Git is not a backup system. It's not exactly providing any redundancy. If you lose the disk, you're going to lose the repository as well. But the analogy holds in the way that it's holding snapshots. The next thing that Alice does to set up the repository is to create a .git ignore file. It's similar to that other ignore we saw before. The difference is that this one is for the repository only, and Alice may have multiple repositories on her machine. So this git ignore file is for this project, and it will contain files that are created by, let's say, the build system. So maybe the PDF generated by the book will be listed here. Note that this belongs to the repository and will be the same for all contributors, unlike the other ignore file we saw before. There is another way to initialize a repository, and we'll learn more about this later. It is when there is already a repository on a remote, and we just want to have a copy of it. But for the time being, git init is the way to go. Now that we have a repository, we need to create those snapshots. In something like Time Machine, you don't have to say when you want to create a new snapshot because Time Machine will back up the whole computer every 15 minutes or so. But with Git, we have a lot more control over what goes into each snapshot, and therefore we have to do more work. If you're only going to use the graphical user interface for one thing, let this be it. It's possible to commit from the command line, but it's a lot more ergonomic to just do it from a graphical user interface. Preferably one in the text editor, but first I'm going to show you the GUI that comes with Git, and you can invoke it with Git GUI. That's what Alice did right here. This interface contains first a panel on the upper left with changes in the working directory. So now that the repository is just starting, everything that is in the working directory is a change. It's a new file. And you can see two files listed here. On the lower left pane, there is a list of changes that will appear in the next commit. This is sometimes called a staging area or the index. Alice can control what is going to appear in the snapshot. Unlike Time Machine that just backs up the whole disk, Alice can tell which files will appear in the snapshot and even which lines in the files will appear in the snapshot. Next, on the bigger pane on the right, there is a listing of lines that change. 
And because this is a new file, all lines were added. But later, Alice may just change a couple of lines in the file and remove lines and add lines. They will be listed here and she may even only select some of them to be in the next commit. Next, Alice writes a message. This is going to go along with the snapshot. For the time being, this may be just a note to self or even just some nonsense, like just a dot. Later, we'll learn how to craft better commit messages. Finally, Alice clicks on commit, which creates a new snapshot. And ideally, she does that often, because if something is committed, there is no chance that she will lose the recipe later, because she deleted a file accidentally or something like that. Now, I told you that ideally, Alice would be using the Git support in her text editor. And for example, her text editor is Visual Studio Code that comes with Git support. She didn't have to install any extensions or something. You can see that the panels are in different places, but they are more or less the same. And in almost every text editor and IDE, you are going to find a similar support for Git. There is also a way to create a commit by fixing the last commit. So remember that commits are immutable. You cannot really change the contents of a commit. But you can always create a new commit that has similar contents or maybe just a different message. Maybe all you had was a typo in the commit message. So you can come here to this graphical user interface or on the command line, you just fix the last commit, you amend it. Note that this is a dangerous command to run because it's rewriting history. It's creating a new commit that is supposed to replace an existing one. So Alice must only run this command to amend a commit if she has not pushed yet. Later we will understand more what this means. For the time being, just think of pushing as publishing the changes to possible collaborators. And that's the reason why Alice doesn't want to amend commits after she has pushed. Because the collaborators may already have the history and then it would clash. But this is not the only way to create a new commit. Besides creating a commit from the changes in the working directory, Alice may also create a commit by copying the changes from another commit. In this figure on the right, you see a commit that creates a new file. On the left, Alice created a commit that replicates that change on top of her existing commit by creating the same file. Note that it's not reproducing the whole state of the working directory, including all the files in the working directory, but only the effects of that commit by creating one new file. This is an operation called cherry picking. And note that it may be dangerous because it may change the contents of the working directory. In most cases, it will. So it's best to only run this command if the working directory is clean. In other words, if there are no changes, no files that were added or removed. If she wants to run this command and there are some changes in the working directory, it's best to first create a commit and then run cherry pick. Finally, let's learn about another way of creating a commit that is similar to cherry picking, but the reverse. Instead of copying the contents of a commit, by reversing a commit, it copies the opposite effect of a commit. So in this example, the commit in the middle is creating a file. To revert it, it's to remove that file. And Git is smart enough to revert any kind of effect, creating files, removing files, changing lines, anything at all. Again, this command may be dangerous. It may change the contents of the working directory. So it's best to only run it on a clean working directory. Oops. This is a very common mistake. What happened here is that Alice committed a file that shouldn't be in the repository. For instance, in this case, she committed book.pdf. And that is the book that was generated by the build system, the final thing that she would publish. But it shouldn't be part of the source that is tracked by Git. Can you help her fix this? And also, can you help her set up the repository so that this error cannot happen again? Pause this video now, refer to the cheat sheet down below, and try to solve this. Then hit play and I will show you how I would solve this. Okay, so let's help Alice. 
Here we have the repository in which Alice committed the book. And we can see that book PDF is in here. Now, the first thing Alice needs to do is to remove that book from the repository. And if she just committed it, then she may be able to amend the previous commit. But let's suppose that this was left a notice for a long time and she may have pushed and collaborators may have already that history, so it's best not to rewrite history. Instead, what we do is to just remove the book from the repository. And if there is only one commit that is adding the book, then Alice may be able to revert that commit. But let's suppose that this is not the case. So what we need to do here is just to remove the book and then create a new commit. Here is an example of how to create a commit from the command line. Now the book is no longer in the repository. It's also no longer in the working directory, so she may just want to move the PDF somewhere else and then bring it back later. But we now have to address the bigger issue, and that is the book should never have been committed in the first place. Ideally, collaborators wouldn't have to worry about this, it would just work. So what Alice needs here is a gitignore file listing book.pdf. Okay, so in this line, we are creating a .gitignore file listing book.pdf, and then we are committing that .gitignore file. Now, suppose that she runs the build system and it generates book.pdf again. In this case, I am simulating the build system by just running touch. Now this file exists in the working directory, as we can see here. Still, when we run git status to check the state of the repository, it's clean. There are no changes to be committed. So book.pdf will never be committed again by mistake. Now Alice is doing that again and again, creating more and more commits with snapshots of the working directory as it progresses over time. And she wants to be able to answer the questions she began with. Things like, who contributed the brownies recipe? Or when did I add cocoa to cookies? Or why did I remove flax seeds from cake? Or how much sugar was there in the pancakes last month? All of these questions can be answered by navigating the history of the project. In this drawing, the history of the project is represented by these circles. Each circle is a commit, and time is going from the bottom up as before, and commits are pointing down to their parents. Each commit includes author, date, the commit message, what changed, an identifier. Alice can use Git tools to navigate in this history. The simplest tool to use is Git K. It already comes with Git, and it shows the drawing from before on the upper left and all the information in the commit. Besides visualizing the history, Alice may also want to navigate in history. So there is a command called checkout just for that. The effect of checkout is, first, it changes the contents of the working directory, as you can see in the middle of the drawing. The contents of the working directory now reflect some point back in time. Also, doing a checkout moves a reference called head in the repository. Head is always pointing at the commit represented by the working directory. So as Alice moves back in time, so does the head reference. And if all Alice wanted was a lightweight backup system that isn't really providing any backup at all, this would be enough. And in some projects, this is good enough. I have many small repositories with, for instance, configuration for a text editor. And these are repositories I keep only for myself. I don't really have contributors to them. All I want is just to be able to see the reasons why I change things over time. So I just want a lightweight time machine for one directory. But that's not what Alice wants. She wants to collaborate with other people. So now we need to learn about remotes. Remotes are just other repositories. They may be other directories on the same machine, they may live in other machines. All machines that are accessible via SSH, for instance, could have remote repositories. And there are even services dedicated to hosting Git repositories. You may have heard some of these names, like GitHub, 
and GitLab and Bitbucket. And in some cases, the remotes don't even host the Git repository for the history's sake. Instead, Git is just the transport protocol to get the code somewhere. For instance, if you use Heroku to deploy a web app, the way you send the code for them to deploy is using Git. Git is not really being used here as a version control system. It's more similar to rsync or SCP, just a way to transfer the files. These are just remotes, and there may be multiple remotes for a single repository. The most important thing to remember about remotes is that they contain the whole history of the project, not just the current state of the working directory. So when publishing changes somewhere, you are publishing the whole history of the project. As you can see from this drawing, any machine may connect to another machine and send changes and get changes from their remotes. But there is a typical topology for this network, a typical way that people tend to use Git, and we are going to see that now. This is a cloud service hosting the canonical source of the repository, and all contributors pushing changes to that place and pulling changes from that place. Typically, people use GitHub as that remote host. And to create a repository in GitHub, it's really simple. You just create an account and you click on new, and that's it. But it's important to note that Git is not GitHub. Git is a tool. GitHub is a service provided by Microsoft to host Git repositories. It's like GitHub is to Git what Gmail is to email. You can use Git without GitHub the same way you can use email without Gmail. You can have an Outlook account or iCloud, or you can even deploy your own email server. In fact, in many ways, deploying your own Git server is a lot simpler than deploying your own email server. So Git is distributed, but that's the typical topology. There is another way to create repositories in GitHub besides just creating one from scratch. We all have access to Alice's repository because I and Linda and Alice herself, we are all added as contributors to Alice's repository. But if the repository is public, and repositories in GitHub may be private, but if this one is public, someone that we don't even know might want to contribute but they don't have the privilege to do that. So what they can do is create a copy of the whole repository that belongs just to them. This is usually called a fork. And that's how many open source projects receive contributions via forks. Okay, so Alice went to github.com and created a new repository. Now she needs to link her local repository to the remote one. And the way she can do that is by adding the repository as a remote. Now there is this list of remotes in her local repository. It looks like an address book, mapping names to addresses. The address she can gather from github.com. The name, well, she can give any name she wants. Typically, the canonical source of truth is called origin. But Alice may have other remotes, for instance, to deploy to Heroku, let's say. What about Alice's collaborators? they may not have a local repository to add a remote to. Well, in that case, what they can do is to clone the repository from the remote onto their machines. Remember again that this is cloning the whole history of the project. They just need to provide the URL that they can find on GitHub. And clone is going to set up the origin remote automatically. The connection between the local repository and the remote is established. What can we do with this? Well, first, we can push the local changes to the remote. This is pushing the whole history of the project, all the commits in it. Next, we can pull the changes from the remote into our machines. So if someone else pushed changes, we can pull the changes and get them in our local copy. Typically, git pull is the command that you want to run. But it's important to understand how it works, so let's dive a bit deeper. A pull is the same as a fetch, followed by a merge. Let's start with fetch. So in this local repository, 
we see now two references. Master is our notion of the local repository right now, and we'll learn more about the significance of master later. Origin slash master is our local point of view of what the remote looks like. So in this case, it's Alice's notion of what GitHub is right now. But it so happens that one collaborator pushed a change in the remote. So the remote now has a new commit that is not visible from the local machine. What fetch does is to sync this notion so that the local machine understands that there is a new commit on the remote. It does not, however, change the master reference that is what the repository looks like right now. So to do that, the second command in the pool is merge. And if this is a very simple merge, it's just a fast forward because the master reference is just updated to point to the new commit. But let's investigate a more intricate scenario. In this case, locally, Alice has made a new commit, maybe a new recipe for cookies. Meanwhile, a collaborator pushed a new recipe for muffins. When Alice fetches, she gets the new recipe for muffins alongside her recipe for cookies. The history now has diverged. Master and origin slash master disagree. One contains one new recipe, the other contains another new recipe. Alice may even use git checkout, as we saw before, to navigate between these two different notions of the world, but they are out of sync. So merge now will be a three-way merge. This merge is going to reconcile the two recipes and create a new commit. This new commit is bringing the two different universes back together. But this may result in a conflict. Usually the changes in different timelines are unrelated. One recipe for cookies, one recipe for muffins. Git is smart enough to merge those two universes automatically. But if the same lines in the same files changed, then that requires manual intervention. Git cannot do any better. This new commit that merges the two different timelines together is special in a couple of ways. First, the obvious, it has two parents because it's converging two different timelines. But also, it contains the changes of both universes. In that commit, there are the changes creating the cookies recipe and the muffin recipe. Can you recognize this data structure? It's a data structure that diverges and converges back again. Pause the video for a second and think about it. The history of a Git project is a directed acyclic graph. There is no way for a cycle to exist because commits can only point to their parents and there is no way for a commit to be its own parent. Okay, so if all Alice wanted to do was to collaborate with her friends with some recipes, this would be good enough. But she may want to scale this project a bit further and have different notions of the timeline diverging and then converging back again, not only because people pushed concurrently, but on purpose. So now we need to learn about branches and merges. We have been using branches even without knowing it, because Git maintains a branch called master by default when we create a repository. Anytime we commit, the master branch is advanced automatically. Master is not special in any way, it's just a convention. It usually represents the main timeline for the project. So if you are ever wanting to show the canonical version of your project, you would go to origin and check out the master branch. But it doesn't have to be the only branch in the repository. We already saw origin slash master, but that's a special branch that we typically don't touch by hand. We use tools like git pull to do that automatically for us. But in some cases, we may want to have a separate branch on purpose. For instance, suppose that Alice is working on a recipe for cookies, but she's not ready yet to have that as the master timeline because the recipe is not ready for prime time. She's still working on it. So Alice creates this new branch called cookie. To begin with, master and cookie point at the same commit. Branches are just references pointing to commits, so multiple references may point to the same commit. 
You may want to create a new branch when you are working on a new feature for your software or you're fixing a bug, that sort of thing. Usually those branches are called feature branches. What's special about having a new branch is that when Alice commits to the cookie branch, the cookie branch advances, but master stays put. So the cookie recipe is only visible in the cookie branch. Alice may even push the cookie branch to a remote. And if she does that on GitHub, then the way usually things work is that people push a branch to GitHub and then they create a pull request. A pull request is just a way to document, so here is a new feature or a bug fix and I want to merge this back into the main timeline. So when that happens, the graph looks like the one in the bottom, in which the history diverges and then converges back again, similar to what we saw before. But pull requests may even occur across forks. So a pull request may be open to merge two branches from the same repository or to merge two branches across forks. And that's how people that we don't even know may collaborate to the cookbook if the project is public. A pull request is a chance to review and discuss the changes before they are part of the main timeline. Ideally, people avoid long-running branches though, because if the discussion takes too long, it tends to never go anywhere and it's never merged back into master. So ideally, pull requests are not left open for too long. How long that is may depend on the project. And there is one final variation on branches that Alice uses, and that's a tag. A tag is similar to a branch in that it's just a reference to a commit, but it's immutable. It points to the same commit since it was created and forever. The purpose of tags is usually to mark releases. So when the book is ready for publishing, Alice may create a tag. For instance, in this case, it's the version one of the book. And there is one final topic I want to cover, and that is rewriting history. I told you before to just commit often and don't worry about commit messages too much or even about the contents of the commit too much. But hang on, I said before that commits are immutable, so how can we rewrite history? Well, we don't do it by changing the existing commits, we just create a new commit with all the changes we want to make. In this case, we have four commits that really should be just one because they were maybe experimenting with something and modifying it and then reverting. But then finally, when work is settled, we can squash all these commits into just one. And what happens to the other four commits? Well, the original four commits are just unreachable. There are no references to find them in the graph. There is no path you can take following the arrows to get to those commits. So they are as good as gone. They are the closest thing to actually deleting a commit. In fact, if Git runs a garbage collection routine, which happens from time to time, the commits will really be unreachable forever. Squashing commits together is a good way to rewrite the history, and it's also an opportunity to write a good commit message, explaining the discussion that went on in the pull request, and the alternatives that were considered, and references to learn more, that sort of thing. Oops, number two. This is based on many real stories with real students. It often happens that people commit to the wrong branch. In this case, Alice was working on her cookie recipe, but she committed to the muffin recipe. Now she wants this commit to appear in the right place, and she also wants to get rid of the wrong commit. Can you help Alice this time? Pause the video, refer to the cheat sheet down below, find the commands that you would like to run, and then come back and we'll try to solve this problem together. Okay, so let's try to help Alice. Here we have a repository in the state that she left. And we can see this repository by using git k all. We can see that we are currently on the master branch. There is also a cookie branch and a muffin branch in which there is a wrong commit. There are two things we need to do to solve this problem. The first is to copy this commit into the right branch. And the second is to get rid of this commit altogether. Let's start by copying the commit. So we can check out the cookie branch. And then when we refresh, we can see that now we are on the cookie branch. And now we can copy the commit from the muffin branch. 
I could come here and copy the identifier for this commit because it's the one selected. But I can also just cherry pick Muffin because Muffin is a branch pointing at this commit. When I do this and refresh, now there is a commit on the right branch. The changes in these two commits are the same. Finally, we have to rewrite the history here on the Muffin branch. And there are different things we may need to do. If we have not pushed yet, then it's fine for us to just come here and rewrite history and maybe just make Muffin point to the previous commit forcefully. But let's suppose that we have pushed already. So now we need to revert this commit. We check out the Muffin branch. And when we refresh here, we are on the right branch. And now we can run git revert. And we have to say which commit to revert. In this case, we want to revert the current commit, so I can see head. I could also say muffin. Running this command makes my text editor pop up, because we may want to write a better commit message explaining why we are reverting this commit. But in this case, I'm going to just save and close. And now when we refresh, we see that we reverted that commit. And we may even now push all these branches. So there we go. We just helped Alice solve this very common problem of committing to the wrong branch. But there is a lot more that Git can do. For instance, there is the ref log that keeps track of the most recently checked out branches. The ref log may help you in case you run some wrong commands and end up with unreachable commits with code that you care about. There is also bisect that allows you to provide a test and a commit in which the test passes and a commit in which the test doesn't pass. And Git will do a binary search to find the commit that introduced a bug. Also, there is filter branch for you to systematically rewrite the history of a Git project. If you want to learn more about these commands and many others, I suggest that you read the pro Git book and the manual reference. But for now, let's recap what we learned. First, commits are atomic and immutable. You can only go back and forward in time with the whole repository, not with just a single file or directory. Also, once a commit is created, it can never change. The commit history forms a directed acyclic graph, and Git has commands for you to manipulate this graph in almost any way you can imagine. Branches are just references to commits, they're just pointers. And finally, remote skip copies of the whole history of the project, not just the current state of the repository. That was version control with Git, and I am Leonard Facchinetti. Thank you very much for your time.